Sometimes we get that confused. Sometimes we think we should give government our heart. And our candidate, is like, speaks, he's the answer for everything. And he is, or she is, the going to be the leader of the free world. And, you know, my hope is in them. I, I wouldn't put your hope in any man. I'm not part of this world. I'm part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God in the hearts and lives of his people that bring restoration and life to a broken and dying world. I am a kingdom Christian, faith first, and then politics second. I am faith first, politics second. If you would like weekly content that builds your faith and helps you walk out all that God has for your life, subscribe and be a part of Life Family. Well, this past Sunday was phenomenal for all the Life Family churches. 188 life groups were created. And thank you for signing up. 3,267 signups. Isn't that great? And if you haven't jumped into a life group yet, uh, there's still time. I'd love for you to jump in there and, uh, and get out of rows and into circles. I, I got a story this week sent to me by an elderly man. He said he was in the, the um, check. Uh, he was going through the, the order line through McDonald's in his car, and uh, he was ordering, and a lady behind him apparently thought he wasn't going fast enough. It's just laid on her horn. And uh, so that he, he pulled up then to the, to the first window, and he said, I want to pay for my order and the, the lady behind me in the car. And so uh, he then pulled up to the next window to get the food. Well, when the lady pulled up to the, uh, to the cashier window, she must have told her what the elderly man did. And so she just leaned out her window and just like, thank you, thank you. Obviously so embarrassed to how she had acted with the rudeness there. And the elderly man got up the second window. He showed him two receipts. He said, I want the food I ordered and the second a meal I ordered as well. <laughs> so when the lady pulled up to get her food, she had to go back all the way to the queue and start all over. To which the elderly gentleman said to me, don't mess with old people. We've been here a long time. <laughs> Starting a new series today called House of Cards. Maybe my final sermon as your pastor <laughs> ever. <laughs> House of Cards. What does life family believe about the elections that are upcoming? And what does the Bible say about elections that are upcoming? Well, some of you are saying, finally, finally, you're preaching on this. And others, you, others of you are saying, you know, if we leave right now, we could get to an early brunch. <laughs> well, the reason we talk about politics is because Jesus talked about politics. And so that's what we're going to do. Now, I'm not trying to tell you how to vote, who to vote for, what party to vote for. Um, I'm just wanting to sh shepherd your heart what, uh, during what's turning out to be a very contentious election. And here are our candidates. You have former President Trump. You have Vice President Harris. You have Governor Waltz. And you have Senator Vance. At the highest level, these are our uh, people going after the highest office in America. They get a lot of the attention, but don't miss out on those state elections and particularly those local elections. That's what affects you the most. So don't overlook those in looking for this, uh, you know, all the, the warm and fuzzy of this election. Now, Vice President Harris, she is trying to be the first woman president in the history of the United States of America. She's the daughter of an Indian and Jamaican, grew up in Oakland, attorney general, a San Francisco district attorney, U.S. senator. She's just highly educated. Uh, her policies to be determined. 
I don't know yet. Her, her faith. Her faith is highly nuanced. There are three orbits she has of faith. She's a Baptist, Hindu, and her husband is a, uh, a Jewish man, so Judaism. So those three things is where her heart orbits. Former President Trump, he is trying to be the first president in the history of the United States to win two terms non-consecutively. His policy is to overhaul the, the, the federal government, uh, to get a hold on immigration, to have a robust economy. His faith, lightly churched, <laughs> lightly churched. The polls on these four candidates, uh, it's a dead heat. It, it appears it's going to come down to just a few, few states and many of the people polled are saying they wish they had different candidates to vote for. Uh, this has been the most unusual election in that the sitting president uh, stepped away from running from office. Just bizarre. How long have, have you seen that in your lifetime? I have not. It's just been the most unbelievable thing. And then you have two assassination attempts against the former president. It's, uh, it's turbulent times. Now, whether you are excited about these candidates or not excited about these candidates, there are three temptations to avoid as a believer. You might want to write these down. Number one, apathy. Do not sit this out because you don't get excited about the candidates. Don't sit it out. Romans 13 commands you and I, if we're Jesus followers, to participate in the government on this earth, to respect those governments and to pray for those elected officials. And Romans 13 says the Lord will hold you accountable of whether you participated in local elections, state elections, national elections. That's what, read Romans 13. Apathy, don't sit it out. Idolatry. Uh, don't worship at the altar of party. They have very few answers for what is really going on with the nation we love. We need them to fix roads and bridges. We need them to have robust schools and stay out of everything else in our lives. Stay out of us. Stay out. If you're believing that your candidate of choice has all the answers, you're fooling yourself. Elliot Geyser, political expert, said the ballot is not a banner. The ballot box is not an altar. The voting booth is not a confessional, and your candidate is not the Messiah. Don't worship at an altar party. And third temptation to avoid is fear. A lot of you have a lot of fear about what if the wrong candidate gets in? What if I voted for the wrong candidate? Uh, the future of our kids, the uh, religious liberties are at stake. Yes, yes. All those are legitimate concerns. But if you are a Christ follower because of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, we always are people of hope and not fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So take a chill pill. God is in control. Here's what I want you to really absorb into your spirit. I want you to see politics through the lens of Jesus, not Jesus through the lens of politics. Thank you. Just let that sit in your spirit for a second, and when you are getting all worked up about these elections, remember, I am seeing politics through the lens of Jesus, and if you do that, then you can do 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, comma, for kings who are in high positions. Why? 
that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. What's good? That you would give thanksgiving and prayer for kings and everybody in high places. For it is Jesus who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Who were the kings he, were talk, he was talking about at this time that Paul wrote 1 Timothy? A wicked king called Herod, who was a maniac, but he was king. Pray for him. The second would have been the, the emperor Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And it, it, it was turbulent times. These are the two kings that the apostle Paul is referring to. I urge that supplications, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be for kings and all who are in high positions or in elected office. Are you able to do that? Can you pray for those four candidates? Whoever gets in there, can you pray for whoever becomes the next mayor of Austin, Texas? Can you pray for the senators, the house? If your candidate doesn't win, can you still pray 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4? You can if you see politics through the lens of Jesus. Uh, not too long ago, I prayed <clears throat> for our president. I said, God, be with our president. It was President Biden at the time. President, well, I guess it still is President Biden. I'm so confused <laughs> as to who's running the country. I just don't. All right. So I'm going to go with President Biden. And uh, I, I, in church, I said, let's pray for our, uh, our president, President Biden. I got so much email the next day. It was unbelievable. Not my president. Uh, stolen election. You know, just this litany of stuff. Like, dude, First Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Are you a Jesus follower or not? Get yourself in line. Come on now. Jesus says, if they get elected, pray for, pray for them and submit to them. Oh, did he say that? He said it. Do you remember when Jesus was going to the cross? Do you remember when Jesus was going to be punished and take on the sins of the world? He stood before a wicked government called Rome, the Roman government. He was tried by Romans. And he stood in front of the Roman procurator, Pilate. And Pilate said to him a few things, and Jesus didn't open up his mouth. And uh, Pilate said to him, you better talk. Do you not know that I have the power of life and death over you? I can sentence you to die. I can set you free. And what did Jesus do? The Lord God of the universe standing there looking at a mud ball. He said, John 19 and 11, Jesus says to Pilate, you would have no authority over me. That would be a good place for a period, but it continues, unless it had been given you from above. Do you see that? In other words, Jesus is saying, I, rec I am the Lord of the universe. I recognize that I'm in your territory, your domain, and I'm going to submit to you, and you have the authority to set me free or to send me to the cross. You know what happened. If Jesus can submit to authorities he didn't vote for. So quiet in here. <laughs> Sometimes we think uh, politics is, uh, is a carve out, you know. Uh, we do all these wonderful things in church, and we're faith leaders, and we're changing lives, and then there's politics, and that's just a whole other track. And we don't get involved in that, and God's not interested in that. He actually is very interested in how you vote, who you vote for, and that you participate in the voting, and that you submit to whoever gets in there. Abraham Kuyper, theologian, said, there is not one square inch of creation over which the Lord Christ does not cry, it is mine. There is no carve-outs, even politics. So here are four questions every believer should ask when they go in the booth. Is the candidate able to govern? Listen, they, they may talk a certain way. They may make you feel a certain way. Do they have the ability to govern? Uh, not a Fortune 500 
company, not a Fortune 200 company, not a Fortune 100 company, the greatest nation and economy and, and the, the greatest nation in the world. Does this person, will I elect them to run the greatest uh, nation in the world? What is their view on Israel? This is a little more controversial, but I'm just saying it's from my point of view. I'm a dispensationalist, and so life family is a dispensationalist. What does that mean? It means there's a track for the church in, in God's future, and there's a track for Israel that runs parallel. There are two different tracks. That's what a dispensationalist believes. That's what I believe, and that's what life family is. We're dispensationalists, that God has a track for the church. God has a track for Israel. I want a leader, and Israel doesn't make all the best choice. I'm not saying they're, they're always right. I'm just saying that Scripture is very pointed about how we treat Israel. I need a leader that is not going to, uh, to be indifferent or remove themselves from their support of Israel. Quiet, okay. Quiet is good. I'd say the third thing that uh, every believer should ask is who represents us best on the world stage? Who can sit at a table with the, the Russian president, uh, the, all of the, the leaders of the world? Who can sit there and have the most uh, comprehensive, strategic thing to say where, we, where the world's leaders say, yeah, he's not playing. She's not playing. Uh, we better behave. Need that person there. And then fourth... What is their view on sanctity of life? Uh, <clears throat> that should be in the forefront of every believer. How does my candidate or my party view sanctity of life? Jesus lived in uh, times that were bitterly divided. I mean, it was Rome and Israel. It was racial division, economic division. It was religious infighting. Oh, my goodness. There was this group called the Herodians. And they were, they were believers in God, but they made a deal with Rome uh, that they would, you know, play along because they didn't want to be wiped out. So they were called Herodians. Extremely, extremely liberal faction of faith. Then there was a conservative faction, and they were called the Pharisees. They were the reformers of that time. They wanted to bring Israel back to God. They wanted to make Israel great again. <clears throat> So you had progressives and liberals, Herodians and Pharisees. They hated each other. Uh, but who both of them hated more? Jesus. Man, why? Popularity. Everybody was going after Jesus. And they said, what is he? Is he a conservative or is he a progressive? Let's find out. So they came together. Bitter enemies came together to go after Jesus to catch him to cancel him my enemy's enemy is my friend my enemy's enemy is my friend Herodians and the Pharisees go after Jesus Mark 12 4 later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians progressives and conservatives to Jesus to catch him catch him we want to catch him and we want to cancel him. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Now, here they go. Here they go. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we pay? Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he said. Bring me a denarius. That's a, a, a day's wages. That's one day's work wages. Let me look at it. They brought the coin, and he asked them, whose image or icon is on this? Whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what's Caesar's, and to God what's God's. Drop the mic, walk off. <laughs> and they were amazed at him. 
They are trying to trap him about taxes, and in particular, this one, imperial tax. There were many kind of taxes in Jesus' day. One was a temple tax. That's the tax you paid to keep the church going for the Jews, the temple and so forth. There was a civil tax that you paid, you know, roads and whatever they have. And then there was an imperial tax, and that imperial tax was paid directly to Rome, directly to Rome. And uh, it went right into the Caesar's hand so they could occupy them further and take more territory. When you walk up to the booth to pay your imperial tax as a Jew, here was the banner that was hanging in front of every tax collector booth, divine Augustus Caesar, son of God, imperator of land and sea, the benefactor and savior of the whole world has brought you peace. Do you know how galling it had to be to walk up to that booth and give that man that claims to be son of God your money? Well, this was such a heated issue. They knew they could trap Jesus. The Herodians, progressives, they believed if, if Jesus said, uh, yeah, don't, don't pay that tax, then then uh, they would turn him over to Rome and say, he, he's telling people not to pay their taxes. Uh, if Jesus says, yes, pay your taxes, then the Pharisee said, see there, he's a sympathizer with Rome. We can discredit him. They made it a binary question. Should we pay it or not? Jesus holds it up and he contrasts two different governments he says, give to Caesar what Caesar's. If you're on this earth, give Caesar what Caesar's. But you are not a citizen of this country. You are made in the image of God. Give God what's God. In other words, give Caesar your money, but give God your heart. Sometimes we get that confused. Sometimes we think we should give government our heart. And our candidate, is like speaks, he's the answer for everything. And he is, or she is, the going to be the leader of the free world. And, you know, my hope is in them. I, I wouldn't put your hope in any man. I'm not part of this world. I'm part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God in the hearts and lives of his people that bring restoration and life to a broken and dying world. I am a kingdom Christian, faith first, and then politics second. I am faith first, politics second. Question for you, question for you, question for you. Are you an American Christian or a Christian American? I'm a Christian American. I see politics through the lens of Jesus, not Jesus through the lens of politics. If you are a Christian American, sometimes you will find yourself taking positions that don't match your party, said Tim Lucas. Let's talk about four hot button issues. If I haven't stepped on your toes enough yet, <laughs> let's make sure I step squarely on them now. <clears throat> Let's put up the four big issues. Here they are. Sexual ethics, value of human life, social justice, immigration. That's the four big ones in this election. And your candidate has taken some sort of position on these. Sexual ethics, of course, about marriage and uh, gender identity, value of life from womb to tomb, uh, social justice, uh, what is our obligation to take care of homeless and widows and orphans and immigration? We see this uh, it, it, from our porous borders and what is done to our cities and, and hospitals and, and all of this. And what's our stand on that as a believer? Okay, let's just take them one by one, all right? So if you're a progressive or a conservative, you're going to land somewhere in, in, in these areas, probably according to your party. But I want to tell you, you're not party first. You're Jesus first, party second. Concerning sexual uh, sex ethics, 
Here's the words of Jesus, Matthew 19, four through five. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus defines marriage, not the government. Marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman, the end. But my uncle, but my aunt, but my cousin, but my brother, good. They can define it how they want. But if you're a Jesus follower first, it's man and woman. And gender is not fluid, male, female. What about uh, the value of human life? Uh, One candidate says uh, abortion is is reproduction rights for uh, a woman. Uh, that it's just tissue that you can be, if it's put in there, it can be removed. It, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's nothing yet till it breathes air. Mm. Psalm 139, 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Jeremiah 1 and 5. You remember Jeremiah? Jeremiah was a, and he was a prophet. Jeremiah 1 and 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That's just not tissue. That's just not, that's a soul. Now, you're going to fall on one of those or the other. It's a tough issue. And I know that a third of the ladies that I'm talking to right now have gone through that. And uh, my heart is for you. And I love you, and I love the mother, the unwed mother, the single, uh, the single lady that's carrying a child. That's just what I do here. Compassion, compassion, compassion. Social justice. Psalm 140, 12. Um, I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. I know that. And then in Matthew 25, the Bible says, the Lord is going to welcome you into his sight because you chose Jesus to be your Lord. And he's going to say, come, you who are blessed of my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then he's going to look you square in the eyes. Get ready for this meeting. It's coming. All right, you heard it right here. I don't want you to go off and when you get to heaven say, I I didn't know this was coming. I'm telling you right now, this meeting is coming for you. Get ready. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was in prison. You came to visit me. And we're going to say, well, when did we do that, Lord? When you did it to the least of these brothers and sisters, you did it for me. Social justice. All right, what, uh, what about immigration? What does Scripture say about immigration? For you are to love those, Deuteronomy 10, 19. This was a bedrock that Jesus, that God kept repeating, repeating, repeating. For you are to love those who are foreigners. For you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Okay. So does that mean that we can't secure our borders? Of course not. We should. Every country should have safe borders. Every country should have a pathway for you to become a legal citizen of this country. Of course, we're all immigrants at one time. We come from immigrants. We need this to be in place. We've got to have a secure border. Got to. Now that with... With that being said, with that being said, let me just say this. Whoever got here and however they got here, our job is to love. Love, 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 and help. A Christian should be a kingdom independent, which means we're not, which means we're progressive light and conservative light because Jesus doesn't ride the backs of donkeys and elephants. He is the Lamb of God. (laughs) 
So I want you to do these two things for me. I've given you a lot of information. How many of those four, can you put those four big hot button issues back up there? Uh, so sexual ethics and the ability to choose to give life or not, where does that fall mostly in? Progressives or conservatives? And, and who is protecting the unborn usually, the conservative or the progressive? And, and then what about value of human life, taking care of people who have less? Uh, is that generally fall to the place of the conservative or the progressive? And what about social justice, social justice? Does that generally fall to the, 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 the conservative or the progressive? And then what about immigration? Who's strongest and best on immigration? Is usually the, the, the progressives or the conservatives? Okay. How many of these are Bible issues of those four? How many are Bible issues? All four. So don't see this election through the lens of politics. See it through the, lens, see it through the eyes of Jesus and how he views this a couple of things I want you to remember. Don't hijack Jesus for your political party. Don't do that. He is king of the universe. Don't bring him down to some little house of cards stuff that we make up and do to the best of our ability Jesus does not lead your political party. And if you've said that, don't say it anymore. It's not true. Now, there may be some things that your political party does that more align with his word. Fine, say that. But don't say Jesus is the head of your political party because Jesus, I know, died for progressives and conservatives. Amen. Secondly, don't demonize people who disagree with you. You're bigger than that. You're better than that. And you have the love of Jesus inside of you. Do not do that. Joshua 5. <clears throat> I love this scripture. There was a young man named Joshua who was near the town of Jericho. He looked up. He saw a man standing in front of him with a sword. Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you friend or foe? And what did the, what'd the angel say? Neither one. I am the commander of the Lord's army. Are you conservative or are you progressive? Neither. I am part of the body of Christ. I am salt and light in a dark, tasteless world. I don't bend to the idol of politics. My eyes are upon the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I want to pray for our country right now. I want to pray for those who are running for elected office. That's such an arduous, hard, tough thing to do. I mean... It's, it's just tough, particularly at that level, man. It's just, it's brutal. So I want to pray for the candidates, and I want to pray for our country, and I want to pray for you who will go into that booth. You don't have an opt-out. You've got to vote. Vote for someone and get informed about who you're going to vote for. But I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you because... Uh, you are participating in the plan of God. When you give Caesar what's Caesar, give God what's God's. Lord Jesus, I come to you for our country. Lord, we need you. These are turbulent times. Wars breaking out all over the world. Uh, wars without and wars within. We're at war with ourselves and our fellow man. I ask you, Lord, to come and allow the church to be the church. Don't let us fall into the, the stuff that other people fall into during this season. Help us to rise up with compassion in our heart. Proclaim you as Lord and Savior. 
get informed about the candidate we want, go and vote for them. Do that with passion, but help us, Lord, to that we know you're in charge. You have a plan, and we submit to that plan. Help our country. Help our, the candidates who are, are going after these positions. Uh, protect them, Lord. Protect former President Trump. Protect his life. Protect his life. Be with him, Lord. Be with uh, Vice President Harris. And all of the elected officials that are going after office, touch them, Lord. Help them. Help them to raise their eyes to you. How we need you, Lord, for our country. Pray, I pray, Lord, for the people of the church that we would rise up and be the church. You are so good, and I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. And we hope and pray that this message touched your heart. And we want to hear from you. We want to get to know you. There are several links below this video that you can connect and let us know what's going on in your life. So we would love to invite you to do that. But most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, that is amazing and we want to celebrate you. I invite you to text Next Steps to 22999. We'll respond with a text and give you some resources and next steps for your faith journey. So we just celebrate you and want to uh, invite you to do that. Thank you so much for making this decision to follow Jesus, it's amazing. So thank you again for being a part of our service today. We will see you next time. If you don't have a home church, we would love to invite you to be part of Life Family. Remember, you belong here. Join us again next Sunday or any time throughout the week. Hit that bell so you never miss when we post a new video. Hope to see you again soon.